All right, well, I'm going to invite the Hanberg family to come on up this side. Uh, and we're going to have the, the Atkins family, my family, to come up on this side. And there's, so if you guys can come right up right now. So Atkins on this side and the Hanbergs uh, come on this side. Uh, this is, so a child dedication, let me just quickly talk about that. It's, uh, it's an, it, we call it a child dedication, but it really is a parental dedication, to be honest, because it's parents who are making a decision to, uh, and again, if you're part of the entourage with these families, grandparents and, and uh, friends and family who are supporting them, just, yeah, come. So, but it's an, it's an opportunity to recognize a few things. One, that children are one of God's greatest gifts. And not only they're a gift, they're a bit of a trust, right? Because the earth is the Lord's and all who live in it. So everything that, everything that we see, but also every one that we see, it really belongs to God. He's the creator. He gives us life. He's the life giver. And so we recognize when we dedicate a child, we recognize God's great graciousness in giving the child, but also that he has entrusted us with the child. And there's, when you're given a trust, there are expectations as well, right? And uh, as followers of Jesus, we recognize that and we want to uh, honor parents who are making the decision that they're going to raise their child in the Christian faith, to know Jesus, to live for him, to love him. And, uh, and then as a church, we want to be able to support. When parents make this kind of declaration that this is their intention, if you've been a parent or even if you've been a child, I think that's most of us, you realize this is a challenge, a high challenge. And uh, so we want to be as supportive as we possibly can to parents who are making this kind of decision today. So first with the Hanberg family, I'm going to get to pray with them. And this is a great delight for me because uh, my roots with uh, this family goes back quite a ways. I went to Bible school with uh, Ken and Shauna. You can just maybe wave. And uh, so we were in the same Bible school class at Eston College. And um, if making a family was a race, we're in second place. Because uh, these guys got started quickly, and uh, so they're dedicating their grandchild today, and in a moment, we're dedicating our child. So, uh, yeah, you guys are ahead, and, uh, but we're, we're excited for the way that God has multiplied and blessed your family. And, of course, uh, now Dad, Joachim, and Mom, Caitlin, are here with Ethan here today. So now I'm going to just let them share some scripture uh, that they've chosen for Ethan's dedication. He might run away on us. <laughs> so first we have Deuteronomy 6.5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then we have Micah 6.8. He has shown you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. And I do want to add just a little special extra here. I hear there are grandparents that may be watching from Sweden. So can you, if, if you turn around, just wave to Sweden. They're in that camera there. Just, just wave. It's good to see you. I'm partly Swedish, so I do. I recognize the motherland. Uh, anyhow, it's great that you also can join us by the miracles of technology. That doesn't always work, but I hope it's working this morning for your sake. Anyhow. Would you join me? I do not want to be the only one praying. I, I, we've said this before. Let's all bless this family. Let's support them. And let's all join together in prayer. Okay? Father in heaven, we thank you for Ethan. And we thank you for his life. And we thank you that he is a gift from you. And Lord, we just recognize that as you, him, you, <laughs> you Kim, and Caitlin have made this decision together to raise their children, to know you, uh, uh, to, to have the opportunity to respond in their hearts to you at an early age, that we, our desire is with them. We're saying yes to this, to this heartfelt desire that they have. And, Lord, we just want to support them in every which way we can in that. And, Lord, we don't know the paths that Ethan's lives will take, but we do know that you know those things. You had decided before he was born for him to do good works, very specific things that you've got planned for him. And, Lord, I pray you lead him into those things. And so would you strengthen and support this couple and this family 
and this extended family, and even the role that we play as a church. <laughs> and Lord, would you bless Ethan all the days of his life. I pray that he'd know your presence and that he'd experience your love and that you'd lead him and guide him and he'd come to respond to you and he'd love you with his whole heart. Thank you for him. Bless him. Pour out all the blessing you have planned for his life from heaven into his life. We ask for these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. <laughs> amen. Anyone relate to this moment? <laughs> so many people. You got, let's, Yeah, let's give him a big round of applause here. This is an amazing thing. <laughs> All right. All right. Do you want to stay up here and bless us as we, as we uh, do? Unless you, unless you need to. Unless you, you know the rules. Here at Hillcrest, we love kid noise. We never want, don't want to have kid noise. That's a rule around here. So everything we can do to have as much kid noise as possible, we, we pretty much lean that way. All right. So I'm going to turn things over to my father-in-law, Pastor uh, Charles Greff, and he's going to lead uh, the time for our family. I suppose I should read our scripture before I forget. Uh, Joshua 24, 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. I just felt I wanted to get on your, your level this morning, Jade. And I want to pray this prayer over you. Our Father, I thank you for Jade, who is a precious gift to the Atkins family, created in the likeness and image of God. We pray that no weapon formed against her shall prosper, and that Jade will spend her lifetime loving the presence of Jesus. I pray for divine wisdom for Steve and Marnie as they lovingly train Jade in the ways of the Lord. I pray that Jade will have a reverential worship of fear of the Lord that will shape her choices in life. I pray that she will walk humbly before you, God, and fulfill your purposes. Jade, I now bless you. In the name of Jesus, I declare you blessed. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. Well, isn't that good? That's good. Keep praying for us. <laughs> we need it, right? <laughs> All right. Okay, well, we'll let the families go back and be seated at this point. That's always fun. Um, those of you who are in an entirely different position in life can kind of sit back and laugh and think, I remember that. And Anyways, it's uh, all good. I was earlier telling a story about when my first son was being uh, dedicated. My, uh, you know, it was like, all right, time for child dedication. And my wife and son had yet to even arrive to church uh, by the time that happened. And so as someone was up here explaining what child dedication kind of means here at Hillcrest, she pulled up under the canopy out front and just got out and came right down in looking lovely and, you know, ready to go. And uh, it was total chaos kind of up until that moment. But she made it. It was it was a lot of fun. Hey, we have the chance to hear from one of our ministry partners here this morning, which is really uh, exciting. Uh, for those of you who have been here around Hillcrest for a long time, uh, we'll know uh, of Barrett Croft and his ministry uh, and his family. And uh, we were just chatting earlier this morning, and it's almost 19 years that Hillcrest has been supporting as one of the ministry partners for uh, Barrett and his ministry. And if you were around here, I think is it maybe five or six years ago was the last time we got to hear from um, Barrett. And it was such an encouraging story about what God is doing uh, through him and his ministry and through sports ministries and uh, uh, that kind of thing, and I know that you're in for a treat uh, here this morning. So can I welcome Barrett to come on up, and uh, we'll just say, yeah, welcome him, yeah. Yeah, come on up here, Barrett, and then uh, I'll just say a quick word of prayer for you, and uh, I will let you take it away. Lord Jesus, we just want to say thank you uh, for this morning to be here together as a congregation. 
Uh, we pray that you would just encourage our hearts with your word uh, to us this morning. Uh, I pray that just in this atmosphere already of prayer and worship and commitment to you, um, that we would be inspired by what you are doing in the world uh, and how we can play uh, our part in it. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it's great to, uh, to be back here. It's, uh, there, we're, um, it, it's exciting. There's, there's going to be a few curveballs that you're going to get because some of you don't know what's happened in the last uh, eight to ten days. But uh, I guess it's maybe six weeks ago the journey started, but just even the last eight to ten days. So uh, that's sort of a, I'm going to keep you on the edge of your seat for that one because it'll, it'll come up here a little bit later on. But uh, really, really thankful, um, as Kurt shared, uh, we've been, uh, this has been our home church when we lived in the area previously, and then uh, we've been doing um, sports ministry as sports missionaries for almost 30 years, and uh, for almost 20 of those years, the church here has faithfully prayed for us and supported us and, uh, and really sent us out on a continual basis to go and do wild and crazy things around the world. And so um, usually I've got a few fun stories to share, so hopefully that will entertain you this morning, but also at the end, um, prior to the baptism this morning, I just want to leave with a couple of challenges. But prior to that, let's uh, pictures do uh, a thousand words. So we're going to, uh, I think somewhere up here, there's going to be, yeah, there we go. Um, introduce my family for some of you that don't know us. So um, this is in Fort Langley. Uh, on the far left-hand side is our, our youngest son, Jacob. He just graduated from university. That's crazy to believe that he, he's got his finance degree and um, he is living in Langley. And, uh, and he enjoys the outdoors. So when Kurt was sharing about his story of camping in Banff, well, Jacob and his buddies, they go and do that like two, three times a week. And, and sometimes they're like, they're on a cell range and we don't hear from them for two or three days and they come back and they've had all these crazy stories. So he loves the outdoors. Uh, the bearded dude there is Jalen. He's our oldest son and he actually lives in Regina. Works for the government. Uh, he is Chris, Minister Christine Tell's uh, right-hand man. So... Um, he's there at the legislature building in Regina. And on the far right over here is Joshua and his wife, Katie. And uh, they have also just recently moved here uh, a few days ago, loaded up in the U-Haul with us. And uh, they're expecting their first child in November, so that makes us grandparents. <laughs> All right, so we're pretty excited about that part of it. So, uh, And then, of course, right beside me is my beautiful wife, Bridget. She, unfortunately, is not here because she had stayed behind for a few days to kind of help get Jacob settled um, at the townhouse, and then uh, she got COVID. And so um, she's stayed there for a few extra days. She'll arrive here on Sunday. Um, yeah, so super excited just about our family and the journeys that, that the Lord has taken us on over the years. Um, a, a couple health updates. Next one is... Uh, just recently, that's why I look like I'm, I'm in need of help coming up the stairs here, but on the next slide you'll see uh, two months ago, the left-hand picture was me getting my hip replaced, and uh, my wife is still mad at me about this, but on the right-hand side is the surgery was on the Monday, on Thursday I put the skates on and went for a rip with the Giants, so <laughs> the miracle of medicine, um, and so my, my body is, is repaired and uh, still recovering, probably um, if I slowed down, it would probably recover a little bit quicker, but my surgeon did say, just go and be as active as you can, and when it hurts, then slow down, but then go and do more the next day. So it fits right in with our lifestyle. In 2013, oh, sorry, one more picture. I think there's one more. Before we vacated uh, the lower mainland a couple weeks ago, Bridget and I got to sneak away for one more date down in Seattle. Does anyone recognize that? Yes, that is gum stuck to a wall. <laughs> Yeah, in Seattle, down by the market, it's like a real famous aisleway down by the, the docks, and uh, it's, it's like a 200-meter-long aisleway that's just stuffed with people's gum. And so it's really gross, but it's kind of a romantic picture at the same time. So <laughs> that's my wife and I. Um, yeah, in 2013, does anyone remember uh, the fall of 2013? What was going on in Saskatchewan? No. Grey Cup, yes. We've got some Rough Rider fans here. In 2013, the Rough Riders hosted uh, the Grey Cup. And um, for those that know our story, I was a chaplain with Rough Riders from 2007 until 2013. And so um, you got to see uh, a pretty crazy moment like that where in 07 we won the Cup and then 13 we had another chance to win the Cup at home. The chaoticness of 2013, though, is that 
Um, in the summer of 2013, we had accepted a job out at Trinity Western University to coach the men's hockey team. But we were like eyeballs deep <laughs> in the Rough Rider stuff, and I just said to Trinity, the only way we could do this is if you allowed us to kind of commute back and forth. Yeah, commute from Vancouver to Regina, coach hockey and, and be a chaplain to the football team. So just to describe some of the craziness, even around this weekend here of 2013 was um, we played in Vancouver in Burnaby against Simon Fraser on the Friday night. And I caught the red eye back to Regina because the Grey Cup breakfast was Saturday morning, ministered at the Grey Cup breakfast, hopped on a flight at noon, flew back to Vancouver, played Simon Fraser that evening, got back on another red eye to get back here for the Grey Cup game so I could do that afterwards. That was, that was crazy stuff that was going on. And, you know, people at that time and even now say, what? why would you, like, that's insane. Why would you even consider doing something like that? And for us, um, I, maybe, maybe we don't maybe look at it as that chaotic. We look at it as how God orchestrates our lives. And for us, we've always had the calling on our family's life of being pioneers in sports and to use sports as a platform uh, to integrate faith into it, because sports is a language that's spoken around the world. In two weeks' time, you guys are a week, and next week, you guys here at Hillcrest are doing your own mega sports camp. And how many of you just remember lots of different sporting events, whether it's the World Cup of Soccer, or the Stanley Cup Playoffs, or the Grey Cup that's happening here again in, in uh, November? Sports is just a language that people understand. It doesn't matter what language you speak, sports covers all bases. And so we've always, you know, uh, had the opportunity to hang our hat ministry-wise with Hockey Ministries International and for the last 20 years with Athletes in Action. And that's equipped us and prepared us to go uh, to places around the world. When I was interviewed, and to do stuff like that, that was after one of our championship wins. Um, when I was interviewed in 2013 to go to Trinity Western University, I was meeting with uh, Bridget and I were meeting with all the the leadership at Trinity Western, and one of the questions that they probed us with saying, why do you want to come here? Like, what would be your purpose and, and your mission for our hockey program within the athletic department? And I, I said that we, our desire would be to come in and set up a rescue shop outside the gates of hockey hell. Really strong, bold, powerful statement. Um, and over the years, we have used sports of hockey, we have used the sport of cycling and the sport of football. Those are the three main sports that God has allowed us to minister to from the grassroots level to the professional levels. And you see it on the news every day, especially in hockey right now, like a day of reckoning in terms of all the debauchery and all the chaos and all the wretchedness that goes on within sports. Um, those dark environments need a light shined within it and allow for lives to be changed, whether you're an athlete, a coach, or an administrator. And so part of my challenge to you this morning, before we get really deep into the, the challenge, you know, the opening slide was just a question of, for us, a rescue shop outside the gates of hockey hell is what we've sort of been called to. But my question to you as we dig deeper this morning would be, where are you setting up your rescue shop? Like I said, for me and my wife, Bridget, it's been in the sports of hockey, cycling, and football. But... If you were to answer that question this morning and write down on your piece of paper or stick it into your mind, where is your rescue shop? Is it in places of education? Is it in the places of trade? Is it within farming? Is it in volunteering in your community? Where is your rescue shop? Uh, again, just a, a, you know, going back to a bit of history with Trinity Western, I think... Uh, I'm not sure what the next slide is, but our very first game that I was coaching, this is back in 2013, in like, I guess it would be October, so it was even before the Grey Cup part of it. We rolled up to the University of Victoria, to the hotel we stopped at before the game to unload our stuff, and I was sitting with one of the players, and he, he sort of looked at me in shock. He said, oh, coach, are, are, are we staying here? And I said, well, yeah, this is the host hotel for all our games here at UVic. And I said, why would you ask that? And he said, well, because last year... Um, at the end of the season, we played our last game of the season here, and we kind of got a little bit wild and crazy, and we destroyed a couple of the hotel rooms. <laughs> so at that point, I knew, I was like, oh boy, we've got some work to do here. And, and to help change a culture, and to help understand that these young men, that there's more to 
uh, the game uh, than what the game is currently offering. And we wanted to come in there and, and really we knew that with our work um, of coaching at the junior level, um, that it was really a situation where we were going in to repair young men who were coming out of junior hockey. So just to understand a cycle, if, you were, if you're just one of the youngsters that are here at the front um, earlier, if you wanted to play hockey, you would go into the local minor hockey. So Musha Minor Hockey, you'd sign them up for little tykes and Timbits hockey, and you'd go out and learn how to skate, and then you'd move up through the age group. And then once you're good enough there, then you get to go and play junior hockey, so like with the Musha Jaw Warriors. And then at the university level where I was at, at Trinity, we would recruit players from the Musha Jaw Warriors. For example, Brandon Potomac was one of my players that played here in Musha Jaw. And then once they're done university, then they go and play pro hockey. So that's just sort of a, a pathway that you can see. But this window of 15 to 20 year olds in junior hockey, <clears throat> I'd be here all weekend telling you stories of young men that have come through just our program at Trinity Western of how they have gone through the meat grinder of junior hockey and how they've been treated um, in deplorable ways, whether it was about racism or whether it was about abuse, sexual, physical, verbal, you name it. And in doing so, they just had their joy of life and their joy of hockey sucked out of them and, and had no purpose and really no passion then. And they just sort of landed on our doorstep because we wanted to give them second opportunities. And once they come into a loving environment where we, we told them about Jesus and the life-changing effect that he can have on their lives and he saw how we served and came alongside them without a judgment, they soon fell in love with him again. They fell in love with their life. They found purpose and they excelled. And so we've, over the last nine years at Trinity Western, we've had some great success. We've won some games and won some championships that you've seen here. Um, but more importantly, we've seen salvations. We've seen baptisms. We've seen young men like Brandon Potomac, who left here in Moose Jaw, like close to seven years ago, um, and didn't want to ever put on his hockey equipment again. And now he just graduated uh, from Trinity and he's going to law school, and he's getting married to a great Christian girl from Trinity, and he is loving the Lord with all his heart. Uh, because it was a repair job. It was something that Brandon had to go through in his journey, and at Trinity Western, uh, that what, that's what that program is all about, is repairing young men. Um, I had a, a, a couple of aha moments. Uh, and, and just to give you a picture, like Trinity Western competes at the highest level in the world for, for that, like for university hockey. There's no other faith-based school in the world that competes as high as Trinity Western. They compete in a league called U Sports. And the conference they play in is Canada West. So that's against UBC, U of A, U of S, U of R here, Winnipeg. Like so right across the country, that's the league that they compete in. <coughs> and uh, so we're, we're playing, I forget, I think it was in... Late November, we're playing a game up in Saskatoon against U of S. And if you don't know, they've got a, a pretty good coach up there. In fact, he's so good um, that a really lowly NHL team called the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, they continue to pay him $5 million a year to coach at the U of S. Um, his name's Mike Babcock. He's a great guy that um, is coaching at the U of S after being fired from the Toronto Maple Leafs. And Mike's won some Stanley Cups. He's won some Olympic golds and all these other things. But he's on the bench with the U of S, and even though like, we're a small school in Vancouver, um, we want to compete hard. We want to make sure that every effort, every shift is a, a, a battle, and we're, you know, we might not be as skilled as U of S, but we want to make sure we're competing. And as the speed of the game intensified and some you know, battles started happening, um, there was some emotion started to get a little bit wild during the game. And there was a scrum right in front of the bench. And so I'm, if, if this is the divider between the bench and, and there's U of S and Mike, and here's my team, and I'm standing on our bench, the scrum happened right here. And the refs are in there trying to pull these monstrous men off of each other. And there's all kinds of yelling and screaming. But I, I hear one voice, I'm like, uh-oh. And, and there's Mike just losing his mind yelling at me. And, and I'm like, okay, I, I got a choice here. I can turn and engage. Or I can just look over here and just have this smile on my face and realize only God can orchestrate this type of a thing where here we are, the small school, the smallest school in university sport across Canada, 
competing at the highest level and having one of the best coaches in the game yelling at a schmuck like me from southern Saskatchewan. Only God can orchestrate that. And it, it's, it was one of those aha moments where I was just like, Lord, what, what exactly are you up to here? <laughs> uh, because it, it's just one of those things where you have to realize that as much as we want to do things and, and sort of arrange our lives, God gives us these curveballs and, and, and really challenges us to do things. Our season ended early. It was a 20-game shortened season because of that disease that happened uh, the last couple of years. And so we only got to play 20 games. So we were done in February. And so I went to my boss and I said, Jeff, is there an opportunity that I can just go and, and sort of help the Vancouver Giants and, and kind of do a coach mentorship with them? And he's like, yeah, for sure, go ahead and do that. And so for the last three months of the season, I got the opportunity to work with the Vancouver Giants and um, another aha moment of just standing there working with their 15, 16, and 17-year-old players and being in the thick of it and understanding, like, these young men. Is there any 15-year-olds here in, in this morning or around that age group? Like, 15 years old, they're so, they're so young. Um, and they're supposed to perform in front of these thousands of people and in front of scouts that are going to, you know, draft them to the NHL and stuff like that. And the pressure in the locker room on these young boys and the opportunity to sit beside them and take them out for some sushi and to just help them understand that it's more than a game, that they actually have purpose and they have, you know, they should find passion in that purpose, not just in the game. And so when I had that opportunity combined with that incident at U of S and then the opportunity to be with the Giants, um, there was a moment, that aha moment, where uh, the Lord was like tapping on my heart somewhat gently, but maybe in hindsight he was probably yelling at me and he was, he was yelling the word, prepare. And it just kept over and over, prepare, prepare. Who's going to prepare uh, the younger players to come into this junior hockey environment? If Trinity Western is over here on this side of the meat grinder, and you're getting men that need to be repaired, and Trinity's doing a great job of it, then who on the other side is going to be preparing younger boys to go into that meat grinder of junior hockey? And... Uh, so eight weeks ago, had the opportunity to uh, come to Southern Saskatchewan to Estevan. They're host hosting the national championship uh, to scout, to look for more players on the other side of this meat grinder to come to Trinity Western. And uh, the one day I thought, oh, I, I should stop in at, at Cairnport because Justin is a friend of mine and uh, I've heard lots of great things about Prairie Hockey Academy that are going on and how they're developing these young men. And I uh, stopped in and was blown away. And, uh, and as I was sort of walking around, the Lord just confirmed and, and again was probably at this point yelling and, you know, if you could just, <laughs> again, it takes a little bit to get through this noggin, but it was just like some real strong, like slap upside the head of Barrett. This is where men can be prepared. And, uh, and I, I went down to Estevan uh, later on and the entire drive there and then the flight back uh, to Vancouver that word of prepare, 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 just kept ringing through my head. And so we were sitting outside uh, on our patio, and uh, I said to Bridge, I said, what, what would you think if we packed up and moved, uh, uh, there's a song, pack up and move to California, but what if we packed up and moved to Cairnport? <laughs> and uh, I thought for sure there'd be all kinds of res resistance, and she said, okay, let's go. And so uh, on Wednesday, the U-Haul pulled up to Cairnport. There's all kinds of craziness that happened. And uh, the reason I share the rider story from 2013 uh, and the chaos that that was to move to Vancouver, um, you guys are familiar with what's happening this year. In November, the riders are hosting the Grey Cup. Now, I don't know if they're going to win or not, so don't hold me to that. But it's funny how uh, here we are nine years later, and God has distinctly called us back to this area to work at Prairie Hockey Academy. I'm going to serve in, in capacity of giving some leadership as a general manager, and I get the chance to coach a bunch of young U15s, some 14-year-old boys that are coming to us from all over Western Canada uh, to prepare them to get ready to go and play junior hockey and do that to make sure that they understand that they are, there's purpose in their lives. And, uh, and we're really excited about that. Uh, the next slide, I believe... Maybe one more, or is that the last one? Did we, did we miss? There was, 
And, you know, Matthew 5, 14 to 16, uh, if you've heard me talk before, um, you know that this is my life verse. And uh, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so for us, uh, Karenport is a city on a hill. It can't be hidden. Moose Jaw is a city on a hill. It can't be hidden. Barrett Bridget, when we light a lamp and put on a light stand, it can't be hidden. When you light your light for Jesus, wherever you are, wherever your rescue shop is going to be set up, it cannot be hidden. And why do we do these crazy things? Why do we move our families across the country? And why do we step into these dangerous spaces and do all these different things that might seem wild and crazy? It's because when God calls you and he says, you know, at this season in your life, you were repairing men, and now I want you to go and prepare men. Then you just pick up and you say, okay, Lord, wherever, wherever you want us. <clears throat> um, had the opportunity, so just in closing, my, my two challenging points is around those two words of repairing and preparing. And, and this would be a couple of my, my summaries. Yesterday I had the chance of uh, Josh and his wife, Katie, the ones that are... Um, going to make us grandparents here in a few months. Uh, Josh is also going to be working at Prairie Hockey Academy, so it's pretty cool. I get to work alongside uh, one of my sons. Um, uh, and they've gone to visit some family in Calgary this weekend, and so I took this as an opportunity to uh, work with my older son from Regina. We went to uh, Rona, just up the street here, to buy some lumber to build them a shed because they bought a mobile home out in Karenport. as their first house. They've been married four years, but they've always lived with her parents or us. And so this is their first time to have their own home. And uh, in, in typical BC style, they call it their tiny home because <laughs> everyone wants these tiny homes. And so their, their mobile home in Karenport is their tiny home. And uh, I, I went to home, or sorry, to Rona to buy some lumber, and then uh, I needed some, some screws and some hinges. And uh, I went in, I got the lumber, and then I went into the store to, um, to get some hinges for the door in the shed. And there, there's row upon row upon row of hinges and door latches. And the price is there. It says what should be there. Uh, but the containers are empty. And there was a moment of frustration. I'm like, how? Like, this is moose jaws. Are there that many sheds being built that they're short of hinges? And I thought, well, no, that, that can't be it. And so... I finally, as I looked around, I finally found enough hinges, and, and there was like one black one, one silver one, and like one was a triangle shape, but I finally found, out of all the like probably 20 bins, I found four hinges. And I use that story to illustrate and, and throw the question back to you. As you ponder where you're going to set up your rescue shop, I think the resistance that we throw back when we're asked where your rescue shop is um, is, is it that similar story. When the Lord looks down and, and he wants to set up a rescue shot and he wants to get it built and, and he looks to the church, he goes to the church to, to grab some shingles and to some, grab some hinges and some four-by-fours, the bins are empty. And the bins are empty for a number of reasons because a lot of times we say, well, uh, I'm... I'm, I'm a farmer, and, uh, and God can't use me as a farmer. So I'm, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm not available. The inventory for me is, is not there. Or maybe we're, um, we're a retired family, and, uh, and, and we're, we're, we just don't know where we can fit in. Or maybe we're a young family, and it's just like, well, I don't know how we can serve in our community. And so we come up with all these excuses. But I think even deeper than that is we just a lot of times don't understand what our purpose is because we're either insecure. We don't understand who Jesus called us to be. We don't understand what the purpose that he's lit up in our lives that is just really buried by busyness and buried by insecurity and doubt. And so we just say, God, I'm not available. And so when he comes to the church to go and build a rescue shop, the shelves are empty because we ourselves are empty. We think maybe I'm, I'm not good enough to do something like that. I've failed too many times I missed my calling. God called me 10 years ago, and I didn't step into that. So now I've just got to sit in the back row and let everyone else do it. And he's trying to build rescue shops everywhere here in Moose Jaw. 
and in Saskatchewan and in our nation. But he can't because, first of all, we have to repair ourselves. We have to step forward in confidence and say, no, I'm available, Lord. Even though I've got a, a replaced hip and they fix my heart and I'm a little chunky and I'm from southern Saskatchewan, I'm here and I'm available. Use me. I might be that one hinge that's over here and I'm dusty, but Lord, use me. I might have used to be, you know, at Trinity Western to repair men, but if you need someone in a rescue shop set up in Cairnport to prepare men, then sign us up. And that's my challenge on the repair side. We need rescue shops built wherever God has you right now. Stop being low on inventory. Trust that God's got purpose for you and then have passion in that and allow him to use you. And secondly, on the prepare side of it, um, it's really encouraging to see lives changed. The baptisms that are going to be taking place this morning tell me <laughs> and are evidence that there are rescue shops already set up. It's not like this is a barren desert. Someone was a light in these lives this morning. At some point, someone intersected their lives because they said, Lord, I'm here, use me in whatever capacity. And, and they were a light. And it's not the fact that they did something special. Because as you continue on, like I said, in verse 16 of verse, or chapter 4 of Matthew, in the same way, let your light shine, that they may see your good deeds. So it's kind of cool that you volunteered and you allowed yourself to be used, but it's not all about you. God orchestrates all that so they can praise your Father in heaven. He's just asking you to be available. He's not asking you to be busier and give more and do more. He's just asking you to be available so that lives can be changed. So we have baptisms every Sunday. In fact, we have to schedule them on Wednesdays. And we have to schedule them out at the camp and down at the river and wherever it is because that's what happens when lives are changed. People want to continue to move forward in their faith because they got so much passion. And so when we prepare ourselves, then we can begin to prepare the way for others. And that's my challenge to you on those two fronts. And, and at the end of the day, why? Just like people said in 2013, why would you be crazy like that and do all that stuff with the Rough Riders and commute back and forth? And why would you move from Vancouver and how beautiful it is out there and all the craziness that you can be involved in out there? And why would you move all the way back to Cairnport? Why? And it's not a matter of why, it's just, Lord, here we are, use us. And so that's my challenge to you, in, in as, as clear as I possibly can. Repair yourselves so the church can be repaired, so that we can go and prepare the way for others. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Barrett, for sharing with us this morning. I trust that you're all uh, encouraged and challenged here this morning. We are going to celebrate baptisms this morning, and so we're going to go ahead and roll uh, a video uh, for you to get, introduce you to some people who are being baptized this morning. And I apologize, there is a little bit of an echo on the video. We'll try to clean that up and get that out onto our social media sites as well. But let's run that uh, video, and as we do that, we're going to invite all those that are being baptized this morning to come up here on stage and those that are participating in the baptism. Come on up and we, as we roll the video. My name is George, and I am a software engineer, and I like photography. Hi, I'm Helen. I'm an owner of Unique SK Auto Store. I lived in Moscow more than two years. I'm interested in facing and reading. My, my English name is Charlie Zhang. I was an uh, animation director in China, but uh, right now I'm an uh, English student. I, I have a lot of hobbies, such as reading, thinking, and cooking, and watching TV. I, uh, I have a wife and my son, uh, 11 years old. My husband and my son and my dog. I have my wife, my daughter, and my parents in my family.
in August uh, 2017, I come from Beijing to Toronto. Uh, my friend brought me to her church. It was my first time to hear gospel. Uh, it's, that's a moment I and my family arrived at uh, uh, Canada uh, two years ago. We thank God very much, so much. God gave, gave us sa safety. I, I went to church a few, a few times uh, in China, but uh, recently I uh, join a uh, fellowship with my friend. About 10 years ago, I watched my wife got baptized. I witnessed how God eliminated the anxiety from her and filled her with joy. So I started to learn Bible. Because uh, I read uh, Bible since uh, maybe five years ago, I find a lot of wise and uh, truth in Bible. So I, I want to be a Christian. Well, about 10 years ago, I was in a depressed situation. My software was created by some guy, and they are failing on the market. They are so crazy that my company is facing closure. So one night when I was half asleep, I heard some voice told me that you should love your enemy. So the next day, I made a hard decision. I decided to face that bad guy face to face, talk to her. I'm sure I'm very afraid of that meeting, but I believe God should be together with me and help me. That meeting turned out to be very successful. The guy promised me not to do this anymore. So I believe there is God and He will help. As a newcomer, I got more help from sister and brother in church. I decided to trust Jesus. Well, I have been, I have been seeking, seeking Jesus, Jesus for almost 10, 10 years, from Asia to America, America. From, one from one church, church to another, another. But, but I still, I still have, have so much anxiety, anxiety in, in my heart. heart. And, and until, until about until one, one month ago, ago when, when I was sitting in the, in the worship, worship in Eucharist, I suddenly I, I felt some, some joy, joy and some, some peace through my, my heart. heart. I think, uh, yeah, this is the time. Uh, that's a moment is my and me and my family arrived at uh, Canada. We, we found God in Canada. August 2017 to February 2018, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to follow Jesus. I feel more joyful, more peaceful, more power. Uh, I think uh, me and my family will, will be safe and happy. With Jesus as my Lord and uh, Savior, I believe I will live in a full, joyful life and everything I do has a purpose now. I will honor the Lord. My favorite Bible well, uh, is Matthew 6, 9. After this manner, uh, therefore, pray ye our Father who art in heaven, how would be thy name? The uh, kingdom come, they, come, they will come down, us in heaven, so on earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and uh, forgive us our debate. Uh, us, we also have forgiven our debaters. 
and uh, bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Uh, my favorite Bible for, uh, verse is Matthew 7, 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Uh, Matthew 6, uh, 34. Uh, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Because I want to close God. Yeah. I want my, fr my family and my friend to know I trust in Jesus. I want everyone to know that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I want everyone to know uh, that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I want everyone to know that Jesus is my Lord and the Savior. Wow, 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 wow. There's so much I want to say. I'm going to try to keep it very brief. But I do want to say a few things just as pastor here in the church. Uh, a few years ago, I saw a sign on Manitoba Street, and it was a real estate sign written in Mandarin. And I remember seeing it and thinking, why is there a real estate sign written in Mandarin in Moose Jaw? Because there was not a lot of Chinese families had come to Moose Jaw. But I started to think, maybe there's something about to happen. And, uh, and it's been happening. And uh, just this uh, last year, we started a ministry here at our church called Let's Talk. We said, well, there's many newcomers coming from other countries to Moose Jaw. And so let's start a ministry where people from other countries can come and just speak English with Canadians who've been here for a long time and to get better English skills. So Let's Talk started up. And we already had great relationships through many of the relationships we'd made with other newcomers from from previous uh, years, and so we anticipated that we'd have many of our friends from Africa or many of our friends from Syria or different places would come to Let's Talk. And what we found was one of the biggest groups that showed up at Let's Talk was newcomers from China. And it was a great delight to meet these newcomers who had come and to be able to get to know them and to find out about them and their families and their experience in Canada. And, uh, well, now that was a huge blessing, uh, I think, in the life of Ron and Shirley Lam, who've uh, been to Taiwan and ministered there. And uh, so, again, learning Mandarin was not a waste here in Moose Jaw, but it was a great blessing that God used and able to engage them. And we've been saying for quite a while here at Hillcrest, we were saying when it comes to engaging other people in Moose Jaw and in this area, that make sure you start with... Does anyone know? Start with blessing. Start with blessing. So whatever, before, when you meet somebody new, one of the first things that we're trying to become a habit for us is to begin with blessing, to have a heart of blessing. So you think about everything you want for the people you love. Think about how you want them to do well in their health, how you want them to do well financially, how you want their educational goals to be achieved, how you want their business to thrive, how you want their family to flourish, and how you want them to do very well. Whenever you meet somebody new, start with that kind of blessing, that kind of heart of blessing for people who you meet new. So when I started to see Chinese uh, businesses popping up around the city and meeting more and more Chinese people, and then through Let's Talk, I think that was something that was on my heart, that you would be blessed, that you would be blessed in every way. And, as a, and I just want to say, as pastor of this church, that is our heart for you as a Chinese community, that you would be blessed in every way, financially, relationally, health-wise, but most of all, spiritually in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so if there's anything we can do, I've said this to you privately, but I'll say it publicly for our churches to hear it as well. If there's anything we can do to help... What God is doing in your community flourish, just ask, because we want to come alongside and bless you, because God is working in your lives, and he's doing an amazing work, and we are honored to play a role in that, 
even if it's a small one, we are honored that we are playing a role in partnership with our Lord Jesus Christ in what he's doing in your lives. And so we're really, can we give them another just honoring moment here this morning? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, uh, we're going to have uh, Helen come and join us in the waters of baptism. And Ron Lamb is going to assist me in these baptisms. And then Lynn Fong is going to, uh, I'm going to give her the microphone after I pray for them at the end so she can translate what I pray into Mandarin. So I'm going to try to pray short and clear uh, as opposed to having a long prayer to uh, have to translate afterwards. Uh, we were uh, having a wonderful time meeting together uh, the other day, and one of the things Ron Lamb had to keep coaching me in was time to translate. I would talk for a long time, and then he'd give me the time out sign, like, you got to give time to translate, Steve. So, so we'll try to do that this morning. So, Helen, we're going to invite you into the water here. And right up front here. And I'm going to ask you just two questions. Have you come to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And is it your intention to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. All right. So upon the confession of your faith, Helen, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless Helen in her walk with you. We ask that she would be led by the Spirit and that you would strengthen her to follow you all the days of her life. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. So now we're going to invite Charlie to come. Yeah, yay. We got a cheering section. <laughs> well, come on into the waters here. Okay, good. All right. So, Charlie, have you come to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And is it your intention to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that Charlie is a man and you have made him a man of God. And thank you for your call in his life. Would you lead him by your spirit and would you empower him to serve you? I pray for a strength in his life to serve you all the days of his life. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. 亲爱的天父，感谢你让呃Charlie成为你的儿子。主啊，请你在未来的日子当中带领Charlie吃到力量，让他们一天都活在你的恩典当中。感谢你，主奉耶稣基督的圣名祈求。Amen。So, George, have you come to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. 
And is it your intention to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. We're going to ask Ron to pray for George. Heavenly Father, thank you for this new beginning in George's life. Thank you that he's responded to your call to follow Jesus. May George know this day that you are his father. He is your son. May he sense this day that his old life has been left behind, buried in the waters of baptism. And may he experience the new life of your spirit rising up within him, guiding him, and helping him to live a life that honors you and blesses others. In the name of Jesus, amen. Dinadian 主啊,他起来了,是新的生命,感谢你的圣灵在他心中来带领他,主啊,请你将来让George来拥有你,活着拥有你,也是成为别人的祝福。我们奉上感恩,奉耶稣基督的圣名祈求,Amen。Amen.